uh, Katie Wilgen, who is a senior research scientist at the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation. Dr. Wilging is a medical anthropologist with experience in community-engaged health services research, mixed methods research, intervention development, adaptation, evaluation, and implementation science. Uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Shattuck is um, also a research scientist at the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation. Um, he's an applied sociocultural anthropologist with a focus on addressing health disparities of structurally vulnerable populations, and particularly sexual and gender minority youth. His work is um, heavily influenced by ethnographic methods, multimodal and long-term engagement with local communities and a holistic perspective. So with that, um, Carrie, anything else that, that we should mention in terms of logistics or technology? I can't think of anything yet. Okay. okay. All right, fantastic. Well, um, Katie and Daniel, thank you for joining us today. We will pass it over to you. So, so good morning and good afternoon, and thank you for that lovely introduction and for inviting us to be part of this fabulous series. Um, well, we're gonna hope it's fabulous. Um, and today is really a primer um, pertaining to use of qualitative methods in implementation science. And as Nicole mentioned in um, later webinars, we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty of how to do qualitative research. Next slide. So, so as, 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 as Nicole mentioned, we are both with the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, and we both have backgrounds in um, anthropology. Next slide. So today we're gonna talk about um, qualitative research approaches, We'll provide an overview of data and methods. Um, we'll talk about organizing and preparing your qualitative research team um, and developing your qualitative assessments, including selecting methods, um, designing your interview guides, and also designing observation guides. And this really is the tip of the iceberg. Next slide. So, so we thought we would start with a, you know, an, a, an icebreaker question. Um, but you, what's your experience using qualitative methods in implementation science projects? If you don't mind um, dropping your response in the chat box, that would be great. Okay. So, so brief introduction, um, some background in doing qualitative studies. Using the CIFR um, as part of, of qualitative investigations, great. Um, acceptability and feasibility of potential interventions. Key informant interviews, focus groups, group interviews. CBPR projects using rapid qualitative methods. Great, these, these are a variety of topics that we're gonna to be touching upon today, um, in, including the use of, of, uh, of conceptual models to help you know, guide the framing of your qualitative projects. Using CABS as, as part of the qualitative endeavor, wonderful. Great. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift to Daniel right now, who's gonna talk a little bit more about qualitative research in um, implementation science, and uh, continue to to you know drop your thoughts in the chat box. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Um, and so, uh, because it seems like we have quite a diversity of experience with qualitative research, um, I th we thought we would just start out with kind of a basic definition for what qualitative research is. Um, and qualitative research is this kind of form of inquiry that's informed by a naturalistic approach. Um, it involves the collection and analysis of non-numerical data. So thinking about texts, images, objects, um, audio experiences um, to help understand social phenomena like um, concepts, experiences, and, and opinions in the context in which they, they happen. And qualitative research can be informed by a number of theoretical um, approaches. 
Um, just to give you kind of a, a taste for what some of these might be and how they might be expressed in implementation science, we just have a few to share. Um, the first being phenomenology, um, which comes out of philosophy um, and asks us to seek um, data on what the meaning, structure, and essence of lived experience is. And so thinking about what lived experience is like in implementation for a certain group of people, thinking about end users or um, the people impacted by the implementation. Um, ethnography is another kind of approach for qualitative research that comes out of anthropology that Katie and I are both really versed in. Um, and that seeks to, that uh, asks us to think about the cultural characteristics of a group of people. So an organization, an institution um, involved in implementation and how those characteristics play out or impact the process of implementation. Um, social construction, another kind of approach that comes out of anthropology and sociology um, that really digs into what uh, the actors involved in implementations um, reported perceptions, explanations, beliefs, and worldviews are, um, and what kinds of consequences those have for implementation. There's also critical theory and feminist inquiry. So critical inquiries encouraging us to think about the experiences of inequality, injustice, subjugation, power, and how they shape implementation. And then feminist inquiry is encouraging us to think through the lens of gender. So thinking about how gender shapes or affects our understandings and actions within the implementation process. Grounded theory, um, this one I find really, really fun <laughs> personally, um, but sometimes folks think that it may be a little bit too grand of an approach for implementation science. And you'll understand why in a second if you're unfamiliar with this. Um, but so grounded theory comes from, uh, it, it involves a systematic comparative analysis grounded in our field work to help explain what's being observed, basically. Um, instead of coming into the research uh, with a preconceived kind of theoretical um, idea of what's going on, you're really allowing those explanations to emerge from the data um, and engaging in this iterative process of data collection analysis, theory creation, and then going back and confirming or testing your theories in, in process. And it's not like we're asking you to recreate structuralism or something like that. It's really theories that help explain the dynamics that you're seeing within an implementation setting. Case study, um, we're describing a single unit. This could be a person, organization, um, or institution to help identify um, how a complex kind of set of circumstances really converge to produce the particular thing that you're investigating, this particular manifestation. So thinking about organizational change, you would be using a specific organization or institution to describe how organizational change happens. So all of these have relevance to implementation science, and you can probably, based on the experiences that I've read about in the chat, guess how you kind of pick and choose from each of these things to really inform your research within implementation science. Each has their values and drawbacks. Um, and we typically don't use just one of these in isolation. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. So to, to help us um, further describe qualitative research, a great way to do that is to contrast it with quantitative. Um, so qualitative research examines phenomena through words and other textual materials. And so earlier I said texts, audios, Im audio images, experiences, things like that, that have some sort of um, permanence to them so that we can use them in analysis later on. Even experiences become textual material for analysis through writing it down, through recording, through audio, through images. Um, and so we consider a, quite a broad range of materials to be textual material for qualitative uh, analysis. This is contrastive quantitative approaches that really focus in on numbers, statistics, measurements. Qualitative tends to be a bit more holistic, trying to get more kind of expansive or nuanced understanding or phenomena versus quantitative, which typically tends to be more reductionist, trying to get things down to the specific data points. Um, like, like I just mentioned, qualitative tries to focus on the description. Traditionally, Qualitative research um, has been really bottom up, trying to develop new theories and hypotheses out of the data versus quantitative, which really is top down deductive, trying to test existing theories and hypotheses. 
Um, we will uh, complicate that in a second for implementation science. Um, and then qualitative really emphasizes the voices of participants through quotes versus um, trying to really emphasize replication and generalizability. So qualitative research in implementation science tends to be a bit more positive, positivist and deductive than what has already been described. Um, you're usually coming into this with some sort of theoretical framework or um, uh, epistemological approach that then helps inform what kinds of questions you're asking, what kinds of methods you're using, what kinds of data you're collecting, how you're analyzing, um, rather than trying to um, cast kind of a broad net. Um, you're targeting a priori research, research questions. Um, so uh, you're really focusing in your efforts, trying to be very practical, focused, and time limited, rather than longer term kinds of engagements um, that you typically see in things like ethnography, where you're spending months or years engaged with a particular community. In implementation science, we don't necessarily have that luxury. And so the methods get um, more focused, more practical, dependent on the time that you actually have to spend. Um, qualitative research is inherently multi multidisciplinary and team-based um, because of these kinds of constraints in implementation science rather than the solo researcher. Um, and then we're aiming to really engage multiple partners and settings to uh, sample across the systems and contexts that we need to understand and the types of actors within those settings rather than this kind of longer term in-depth engagement with communities where those relationships build over time and um, you're able to, to take your time with figuring things out. We have to be a bit more strategic in qualitative research with implementation science. So what are some questions um, that qualitative research can help us answer? Um, qualitative research really helps with the what, why, and how of implementation science. Um, so in this slide, there's just a few examples of some potential questions that qualitative research can help us explain. And you can see how these might be tied to things like implementation outcomes. So thinking through um, how do we ensure an innovation is feasible for a particular setting? Um, why do some practitioners try an innovation and others do not? How integrated is an intervention into the setting? Um, why would an organization discontinue or sustain an innovation? Um, why has something not been de-implemented when it's been shown to not be effective? Um, all of these are things that qualitative research can help us answer. <clears throat> and because they're able to answer those types of questions, we can use it for a variety of purposes within implementation science. And you can see across these examples, there's kind of a theme that emerges, right, of adapting to context, adapting to populations. Um, so thinking through developing or tailoring programs um, to specific service delivery contexts. Or process interventions. Um, many aspects of our, our efforts, I think my internet is slowing down, <laughs> many aspects of our efforts to the context and population. Sorry, Nicole, go ahead. We lost you for maybe 10 seconds, but you came back. So we're, we're grateful. Okay. It was a really quick bathroom break. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but so in addition to these efforts to help adapt our, our tools and strategies for research and for implementation, um, qualitative research is really great for gathering data um, to be used for testifying to government agencies or um, local, state, or federal leg legislature. Policymakers tend to say that they really like data and they cite that they really like statistics, but really the powerful stuff comes out of the qualitative data where there's stories that they can grasp onto and then communicate to their constituents or other policymakers. So qualitative research in practice has a lot of um, uh, value for our research, but then also how our research gets used after our studies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then the place of qualitative research methods in our mixed methods research. Most um, implementation studies tend to be mixed method. 
Um, and so qualitative methods can really help with triangulation. So um, looking for um, convergence, corroboration, correspondence of results um, from qualitative to quantitative. Um, complementarity, um, which seeks for uh, elaboration, enhancement, illustration, and clarification of the results from qualitative to quantitative or from multiple uh, methods. Development, which seeks um, to use the results from one method to help develop or inform other methods. And development really includes things like um, sampling, uh, implementation of methods, as well as measurement decisions, things like that. Initiation, um, this uh, qualitative research help, helps us seek um, paradox and contradiction. Um, uh, the data that we gather through these methods can really complicate the stuff that we see um, from results of quantitative methods, for example. And then expansion, seeking to really extend the breadth and range of inquiry by using different methods um, for different inquiry components. And I'll pass this over to Katie to walk us through some examples of um, data and methods used in qualitative research. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so what are we, what are we collecting um, when we're doing qualitative research? First, it's what people say they believe, think, or do. We often get this through um, uh, interviews, focus groups, um, you know, uh, uh, questionnaires with open-ended queries. Um, we also get at what act people actually do, and this is where observation comes into play. We bring these things together to kind of get a sense of what did people really do? What are, what are the unspoken or unrecognized thoughts and beliefs that kind of influence behavior? And we're really interested in the broader context of all three points, how they come together. So qualitative data is really about understanding context. Um, and in implementation science, this includes, you know, understanding context from a multi-level perspective. Next slide. So some of the methods we're gonna talk about today that are commonly used in implementation science include observations, interviews, focus groups. We'll also touch on concept mapping, document review, and we'll mention some other methods um, that um, are also useful, but we likely don't have time to get into today. Um, so observations, um, that comes down to folks um, watching and recording events and processes as they unfold in real time. There's two types of observations. There's structured observations. That's when we use a formal protocol for recording specific behaviors during a certain period. And then there's also participant observation, which is most closely associated with anthropology. And this is where the researcher takes part in activities that they're studying um, and at the same time they're observing and recording what occurs. Um, and I mean, it, it was a wonderful experience when I was able to spend 18 months, you know, in a, in a, in a mental health clinic and really get to know people and, and see what makes them tick and, and what influences the services they were able to provide and, and also the impacts on patients. Um, but just getting to be part of their workaday lives really was a privilege. Um, but that's where you really kind of get into the thick of things. Next slide. So participant observation is, is particularly useful when you do have uh, the opportunity for prolonged engagement because it reduces the problem of, of reactivity. And so when folks don't really know you, you know, they might not respond as they would um, ha had they been more familiar, had they had more opportunity to get to know you. Um, Participant observation also informs, um, you know, the construction of interview questions. When you have time to observe a context that then will influence what you ultimately ask of your participants. Um, it can facilitate in-depth understanding of what's going on in a setting. And it also um, helps you be confident in the meaning of the data you're collecting. Because you do have this opportunity to do repeated observations. And again, that prolonged engagement. Next slide. Um, participant observation typically results in field notes, and these are written records of our observations. Um, they sometimes initially take the form of jottings, 
Um, these are uh, just uh, brief snippets of, 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 of what we're observing, and then they sort of get extended into longer field notes. Um, they include notes of conversations, um, informal interviews we might have in the field. Um, and that's where we also start to record some of our emerging ideas and preliminary insights. Um, and, and we also start tracking how these insights might shift throughout the study period. Um, it's important to note, like participant observation is about hanging out, but hanging out is hard work and it does kind of necessitate obsessiveness um, and skills in organization because you're just taking so much, much, so much information in. Um, later on, we're gonna be talking about doing, you know, shorter term forms of ethnography. Next slide. Oh, here we go. Um, so long-term um, uh, participant observation, which is a hallmark of ethnography, as Daniel mentioned earlier, it could take um, place over months or years versus shorter term ethnography, which can only take place over days or weeks. Um, longer term ethnography tends to be bounded by geography. Um, in, in, in shorter term ethnography, we tend to go to multiple places. Uh, we're not necessarily um, um, limited by geography. Um, long term ethnography is really uh, marked by open and ongoing engagement um, versus um, focused and intense engagement in short term ethnography. Um, with long term, you're typically flying solo. Um, you know, there, there is this notion of the lone ethnographer. Um, that's typically not the case when we're doing implementation science, as Daniel mentioned earlier, um, we're, we're reliant on a team-based approach. Next slide. Um, with long-term ethnography, there tends to be an apprenticeship model to learning, and you're learning from your participants. Um, you're trying to learn about their cultural realities as they experience and as you are privileged to also experience. Um, with longer term ethnography, it's possible to capture more than one instance of a phenomenon. Um, and your data collection analysis and interpretation are often separated in time. Um, with short term um, ethnography, you're relying on background, background knowledge and other experts um, on your interdisciplinary team to help scaffold and, and hone your observations. Um, you try to capture as much as possible in as many ways as possible. Um, it's just not using um, observation, but using a variety of me methods. Um, and again, you often only have one shot to collect this information. Um, and data collection analysis and interpretation um, happen iteratively and, and at the same time. Next slide. Um, when we're doing ethnography or participant observation, um, or when we're starting a new project, um, we often do informal interviews. And in contrast to more um, formal interviews that I'll talk about in a moment, these are distinguished by you know, a lack of structure and control. You don't always have the luxury of having that well-developed guide in your back pocket. Um, here you kind of um, have conversations with folks and, and these are like the basis of your informal interviews and you keep a record of these conversations. Um, and, these, th and this approach is usually, as I mentioned, used in the early phases of participant observation and in exploratory research. Next slide. So, so most of us, and, and many of you mentioned this in the chat, um, you know, we're familiar with doing formal interviews. And, there, and there's three types of interviews. There's structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. So structured is when you have a specific set of questions you want to ask. You ask those questions um, in, with the same wording and in the same order. It's not as flexible as if you're using a semi-structured um, interview approach. Here you have an open-ended um, interview guide. You have your questions, but um, you're able to kind of follow up on the leads of folks that you're interviewing. Um, you, 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 you have some more um, um, flexibility with your probes um, and you can really ask things that maybe you didn't consider when you were designing your guide. And then there's the unstructured interview. And this is where you allow the participant to shape the interview's direction and focus. So like most recently, um, I found myself having to adapt from using my semi-structured guide to an unstructured guide guide when I was I was interviewing a participant who was experiencing housing insecurity 
Um, and they just wanted to tell their story. And I had to just be attuned to making sure that I touched, uh, that, that I guided him um, to address the different topic areas that I had in my semi-structured guide. But this individual really shaped the conversation and its focus. Um, and I had to be willing to adjust to how this participant wanted to be interviewed. So there is a nimbleness involved in doing these formal interviews. Next slide. So the hallmarks of qualitative interviews include using open-ended versus closed-ended um, questions. Again, we really want participants to answer questions based on things that they consider important, not necessarily what we think are important. Um, and we want to uh, uh, provide that space for participants to um, define or elaborate on something they mentioned as being possibly important, especially if we didn't consider it before. Next slide. Um, another uh, common tool in our toolbox in implementation science would be focus groups. And here's where you typically convene six to 10, sometimes 12 participants to discuss and provide data on specific issues. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, I often you know, review papers or grant proposals where people neglect that the focus group is, is the unit of analysis and not the individuals. Um, so there's special considerations that um, you, you need to be thinking about when you're, you're designing your sample for focus groups. Um, I often get frustrated, especially when it's um, you know, a, a, a time of, of, of elections when um, folks share these focus groups they have on CNN, Fox News, or MSNBC, where these are not focus groups. Focus groups are not town halls. Um, they, they really are a small group of people coming together to, to share their thoughts and reflect together on those thoughts. Um, the goal is to get quality data within a social setting where participants um, get to think about their own views in relation to what other people in that group also think. Um, focus groups are useful for, for quickly assessing um, a, a, a group or community's ideas about a specific topic. Um, so what do clinicians in the setting think about integrating this new practice? Um, it's generally not advised for, for sensitive topics research. And it's not about getting into the personal experiences of the participants. Um, it's really about having them collectively converse about that, that topic that's gonna be impacting implementation or that will be important for implementation. Next slide. Katie. Yes. Sorry, this is Nicole. As promised, I'm moderating the chat a bit. We have a couple of questions. I think they might be beyond just clarifying questions though about sort of um, description and use of unstructured interview data and kind of process. Um, best to wait till the end or would you like to address them now? Um, well, let's, let's pitch them. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Daniel should feel free to chime in too. Perfect. So first question here, um, how do you structure, if at all, informal interviews and how might you describe those in your proposal? So um, actually, Daniel and I have a proposal where we have like designed a very short instrument that highlights the topics we intend to touch upon in um, these unstructured informal interviews. Um, so they're kind of like our cheat sheet, um, but we really thought about like, well, we know we need to know what a provider's, you know, think about how welcoming their clinic is to LGBTQ patients. So we have prompts that will guide our conversations when we're talking to these providers. And we wrote about that process in our proposal. Um, Daniel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I think one of the valuable ways that we framed it in the, in the proposal was that it was a part of repeats, rapid assessment, clin rapid assessment, procedure informed clinical ethnography. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's in combination with other methods. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like you're just proposing to just have conversations with folks. Um, and then you're also justifying why you're doing it. We really explained that the reason that we wanted to have these unstructured um, or, or these, these informal interviews is to reduce burden on participants 
um, we're already asking them to do a lot of stuff. And so when we're engaging them in interviews, we really want that to feel natural and um, very low burden for them. Um, but we're still able to get the data that we need because we have those bullet point kind of topics that we want to touch on. Oops. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. One other question here. Um, shifting from an unstructured interview, um, or sorry, shifting to an unstructured interview from a semi-structured um, interview, um, how do you write that up in a method section? I, I actually had to do that recently for an IRB proposal um, based on the experience that I had on this other study. Um, you know, sometimes you'll mention um, time constraints could, could come into play. So let's say I had my, um, uh, I was planning to interview this person for, you know, 45 minutes, but I only have 20 minutes. Um, so I, I, I need to be able to know what my priority topics are. What do I need to address with this person? Um, and that's what I really want to highlight and introduce when I'm, I'm, I'm doing that interview. Um, part of it is just knowing when you have to do it. Sometimes your interview guide is not going to work for everybody. Um, and we don't always anticipate this when we're writing the grant application. Um, but when we're doing the IRB application, we might include some language to allow for such shifts um, and to highlight, you know, these are the topics that we, you know, intend to touch upon in such instances. Um, they can't always be anticipated. Daniel, did you have anything to add? I think you, you touched on it. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions along those lines? Or, or, or further clarification needed? If you could very briefly speak about your experience in the mental health um, institution. I think you said it was participatory ethnography. So I was wondering what you were doing as a participant. How were you uh, able to contribute something in that space? Well, I will say that was back in the, uh, the days when computers were still newfangled equipment for many people. <laughs> and so I was kind of like the, the go-to IT person. Um, okay. I would also help... Um, um, I, I, I would participate in ride-alongs with case managers. Um, I would take part in um, a, 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 a activities occurring in the psychosocial rehabilitation program. Um, so people found ways to plug me in to what they were doing. There was also a lot of community engagement. So, um, you know, with the providers who were engaged in community coalitions, they would introduce me to those coalitions and then I would start volunteering my time um, to, to help further the goals that the providers and the other members of that coalition were working on. So th those were, were some of the, uh, you know, the initial activities. But knowing about computers early on and making myself useful was very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to continue with focus groups unless there's any other questions along these lines. No, please go forward, Katie. Thank you. So focus groups and also some you know doing uh, uh, interviews with folks. They're useful for creating other instruments, particularly quantitative instruments like surveys. They can help you figure out what's the best way to ask a question. What are the most meaningful response categories to include? Um, they can help you get um, down and dirty input into a, a new in intervention or other innovation um, to assess reactions to that innovation and to also get feedback on implementation. Uh, and, and as everybody in implementation science knows, <laughs> they're great for getting a sense of what the barriers and facilitators are going to be in an implementation setting. So you can then strategize ways to overcome them or to leverage the facilitators. Um, useful for field testing a survey tool to ensure that it's coherent. And also, um, I 
I originally started using focus groups to cross check findings that I was getting from my other qualitative methods like interviews, but you can use focus groups to cross check um, methods derived from uh, uh, to, to, to cross check findings derived from quantitative methods as well. Next slide. Um, and then um, more recently, I, I've been using something called concept mapping. And I know implementation scientists are increasingly using concept mapping. And I just wanna give a shout out to the origins of concept mapping, which is really rooted in anthropology and a lot of the, 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 the ranking and prioritization processes that old school anthropologists would engage in. Um, so it really was part of our, our, our original ethnographic toolkit. Um, concept mapping, I like it because it is participatory. It is a mixed method process. It involves free listing, pile sorting, ranking activities, as I mentioned. It's really useful when you're working with a, a wide assortment of partners who might all have different ideas about the key issues that you're looking at. Um, it could be done individually or in groups. Um, and it's useful for determining locally relevant action items and intervention strategies. And uh, you know, these days we also have um, software like concept, concept system software that can help us analyze some of the data we're getting. Next slide. And we recently used concept mapping in a, 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 in a, in a study focused on improving Native American elders access to and use of healthcare um, and, and insurance. And we asked a focal question. What factors make it easier or hard for Native American elders to get good health care? Um, and you know, we, we, we identified about, I think it was 111 unique statements. And we were planning to use this data to um, uh, uh, help us figure out what we wanted to build into a navigation application or app that we were developing for folks who work with, work with elders um, to promote enhanced access to and use of healthcare and health insurance. And we were also using concept mapping to help us think about what do we need to disseminate? You know, what findings do we need to prioritize and get out there? Next slide. Um, so, um, really, concept mapping invo involves a series of steps. The first is to develop that focal question. So we, we asked about things that make it easier or hard for elders to get good health care. Um, so you're brainstorming the responses. Um, then you're having your participants sort those responses into thematic groupings, and they label those groupings. And then you have them kind of rate their responses on several dimensions, including you know, how important it is, how prevalent is prevalent is the issue. So like how, how prevalent is it among elders and how changeable is it? And then you do multi-dimensional scaling. Um, this is how the items relate to each other. You do cluster analysis. So how things get grouped into thematic clusters. Um, and you do this using the software. And that's kind of really cool. And it is kind of beyond my skill level to describe in in-depth detail. But what's fun is when you get the findings and we did collaborative review of the findings with our community action board of elders. And um, you know, they helped us like hone what the, the thematic categories were uh, or the clusters and helped us interpret their significance. Uh, next slide. So, so, so here are some of the key issues and we really tried to build in resources to address some of these key issues in the app we created and also to bring up these issues in the papers we've been writing. So some had to do with, some the clusters had to do with difficulties obtaining and using insurance, um, insecurity that um, uh, elders experienced from lack of knowledge of the healthcare system and insurance systems, limited availability of services, scheduling challenges, provider issues and relationships, family and emotional challenges, health-related um, self-efficacy and knowledge, accessibility and transportation barriers, and then tribal and national policy. What's cool is we did concept mapping with a wide variety of stakeholders. We did it with elders, and we also did it with professional stakeholders, including tribal leaders, um, providers, um, people who provide outreach services, um, and policymakers. 
And you're able to kind of like look at these findings from the vantage points of all those different partner groups um, and like see what do they see is important? Um, where do things converge? Where are their differences? And then we have all this qualitative data that helps us explore these differences in greater detail because we did interviews with all these different stakeholders as well. And you're also able to do things like, well, what a um, elder women of a certain age think about these things versus men of a certain age. So you have a lot of flexibility with concept mapping. So I put it out there as, as something to consider when you're putting together your studies and you have a, a wide range of people that you're working with who all might have different perspectives to share. Next slide. Uh, another common method we use is uh, document collection and review. Um, hey. Documents. Mm -hmm. Sorry, before we go on, there's, a, I think, a, a really nice clarifying question about concept mapping, if we can, just related sure. to sample size. Um, so the question is about sample size requirements, both in terms of the number of partners and the number of ideas generated to, to make meaningful maps. Um, so constant mapping can be done virtually or in person. Somebody just asked that. I have not done it virtually, um, but there is software that can aid you in doing this virtually. We were working with elders and it was really hard for them to use the concept mapping software. Uh, originally we had 111 statements, which is a nice number. We did reduce the number of statements um, um, collapsing those that were very, very similar in collaboration with our community action board. And we did this to ease the burden of the ranking activity with the elders. Um, we had, an, um, I don't know if it's in the notes uh, for, for this slide, Daniel, but we had a fair number of participants. Um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it was, I think we, it was a big sample. But we have, I have been involved in um, concept mapping activities where it's been under 15 people. Um, and I can't remember, so I apologize. I'll look um, um, when Daniel's up next, then I can tell you how many people. But it, it was well over, I, I want to say there were like 55 elders and, um, 40 something um, allies. I was trying so, to think, I, I'm pretty sure it was it was around 60 elders and I don't remember the number for the other. Yeah. We do have the paper citations that we can drop into the chat and we'll tell you. Yeah, I just, sorry, real quickly. I, I, have, I have the papers and I've read them, but in thinking about applying the method, I'm like, is it useful, for example, if you have a group of 12, 12 stakeholders? Right, or do you need a larger group to kind of generate more meaningful concept maps, I guess? I, I, I mean, I err towards a larger group if possible because it helps you really brainstorm the potential, you know, new universe of items. Um, and it's nice to have like as many perspectives as you can, you know, really accommodate in, in, in that, you know, that stage. So that's why I would err towards having a few more than 12. So thank you, Daniel. And Laramie, I would be happy to uh, discuss this with you further. Thanks. Um, so documents are a form of material culture. I obsessively, you know, save all the documents whenever I'm doing field work in a particular um, setting. This includes like, you know, getting all the pamphlets, especially if I'm doing work on LGBTQ issues. Do they have any pamphlets that speak to LGBTQ issues? Um, if I'm um, looking at a particular um, uh, 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 issue, like um, in the past, it was behavioral health reform. I collected all the news articles in that system pertaining to behavioral health reform, um, policies and procedures. Um, you really want to kind of gather and inventory this material because it's relevant to understand in the context you're studying. They can offer stuff into what can't be observed. So for example, events before an evaluation. 
Um, archival text is also useful for learning about institutional and organizational history. So when I was doing, you know, work in an, I, an Indian Health Service uh, uh, setting, you know, I really did try to find archival text to help me understand that system better and how it was set up. Um, documents are useful for facilitating comparison between, you know, official statements. So like what is written into program and policy with what you actually observe and see and hear on the ground. So oftentimes Daniel and I go into uh, clinical spaces where there might be a, a safe zone sticker. And a safe zone sticker denotes that this is a safe space for LGBTQ patients. Um, but then when you're talking to folks on the ground, you find out, well, people haven't had a safe zone training in years and years and years. Um, and that folks might not even know what that um, image means because it was up there before they started working. So it's really nice to kind of compare, you know, the documents with what you're seeing and hearing on the ground. Next slide. Um, other methods that we use in qualitative research include open-ended questionnaires, um, structured vignettes. That's where you would, um, you know, share a fictional story, maybe a clinical case, and then you try to get participants' reactions to that case. What would they do? Great way for getting at barriers and facilitators. There's diaries um, where you have participants to take uh, take written uh, uh, engage in written journal entries, and then imagery using imagery like photo voice um, is is one such technique. Um, having people um, make drawings, um, mapping and network diagrams, and then also um, film and video is is also used in the qualitative toolbox. Next slide. Um, any qualitative methods um, that um, you all use in implementation research that we haven't discussed? Because we'd love to know what else people are using. So um, anything besides the interviews, the focus groups, the participant observation, um, and, and some of these other methods I briefly touched on. If, if there are others, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And as people are dropping into the chat box, I'm going to uh, move on to Daniel. Or am I Daniel? I'm still up, aren't I? Okay. Any other brain writing pre-mortem? Oh, I like that one. Yes. Other ideas? or methods that you've all been using. <laughs> that is true, it'd be a great band name. All right, I'm gonna quickly move on to um, organizing and preparing your qualitative research team. So next slide. So the best folks for your qualitative research teams, you want um, people who are diverse in experience and expertise. Yes, appreciative inquiry. I, I would like to have that expertise on my team. Um, and you want people who will embrace new learning opportunities, people who are curious, um, people who can build and maintain rapport with people they don't know. What was nice about when I was originally able to do participant observation, like I used to fancy myself as a shy person, but you had to like go out there and you had to put yourself out and you had to make these people like you and want you to have you stick around. Um, we don't always have that luxury. So you do need people who can quickly kind of do that, build and maintain rapport. You also need people who can get these folks to share their narrative data with you um, in their own words. And you wanna be able to not lose sight of study goals um, when you're talking to folks. So originally when I was just developing my first qualitative research team, I had one person, superb ethnographer, but she would take the interview in all these other kind of directions because she had an interest in those topics, but they were very much unrelated to what we were studying. It was very expensive transcription wise as a result. Um, you also want people who can put actions and behaviors into context. They kind of need to know something about what they're studying, especially if it's on an implementation issue. And they need to be able to situate what it is they're observing, what they're hearing, and, and contextualize it. 
Next slide. Um, depending on the size of your project, you very much um, might want, want to have a project manager. Somebody can help oversee the qualitative research process when you have multiple team members. You need people who are personable and dependable. Um, you need a good, good data manager, somebody who can keep track of all the data and where it's going and how it's being labeled and where to find it. Um, you need to be aware of and open to disciplinary differences. So one of my first teams was, they, they were all um, you know, cultural anthropologists and I was trying to get them to, to use some of these uh, implementation measures that we just take as part of our standard practice. And, and they were kind of like horrified. They were horrified by the idea of organizational psychology. Um, and over time they did loosen up and they found the value, but you do need people who are open to, to disciplinary differences. They know their roles, they understand coordination processes, they understand timelines. I can't tell you how many times folks have told me, I'll be done with my coding tomorrow. I'll be done with it uh, two days from now. And then it's months later. Um, you want folks who are coachable or teachable. Um, and I also think it's really important to build in um, rewards, um, incentives, um, promotions to keep the people on your team because you want you know, folks who can be a well-oiled machine and you want low tenor. Next slide. Uh, key considerations for qualitative researchers, they are not autonom autonom autom autons. Uh, they are not just like little machines who are gonna go out there and talk to people. They are part of that research process. They are helping to generate that data. Um, they are talking with folks with agency. These are folks who might take you in a direction you didn't anticipate. So you need to be able to be nimble, able to adapt. Um, also understanding that the research process itself can affect what you're studying and the data that you're collecting. Um, we need, need to be aware about the attributes of the researcher. So like, who are you sending out there to talk to, you know, young people who are experiencing housing insecurity? You know, you might want a younger person. You need to be thinking about gender, dress, perceived status, and how that could impact, you know, a, a data collection event. Um, the attributes of the research technique. So being recorded can cause some people to be self-conscious and maybe withdraw. Maybe they don't want to answer if the recording recorder is on. So then maybe you want to turn it off. Uh, understanding that the context of the research itself is going to impact um, what it is that you're able to, to do and what information you're able to get. So you're going to get different answers depending on whether you're asking questions at a, you know, a parking lot of a big box store, a jail cell, a clinic, just the place of where you're collecting this data can have an influence on, 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 on what kind of information you can get. Next slide. It's really important that you build in space for uh, reflection. It's crucial. Um, while a good qualitative research team member will recognize the subjective or contextual aspects of, 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 of qualitative research, noting that it's a major strength, not a weakness. Um, we need to be aware of our own assumptions and biases. Um, we need to know how we are similar or maybe different from participants. Um, we should never assume any similarity um, with our participants and assume just because we might share the same gender or ethnicity that we therefore understand. Um, we need to be able to think critically, honestly, and openly about the research experience and process. And I think it's really critical that we have to be willing to expose messiness and the loose ends of research. Um, not everything's gonna be in a tidy little package. Next slide. If I may uh, jump in, um, Katie, I'm taking over from Nicole now for the rest of the session. And we have two questions that might be interesting to bring in here. One is, um, can you give some examples of common areas of feedback you give to qualitative interviewers? Yes, and this is something we are gonna talk about in an upcoming session when we really get into the nitty gritty of, of, of um, how to do the interview. Um, but we like to pilot 
our interviewers. Um, and so part of that involves um, initially maybe doing some mock interviews, but really getting into the thick of things by collaboratively reviewing those initial transcripts and really looking at, this was a great pro. Okay, this was a missed opportunity. Um, where could things have maybe been asked a little differently? And we try to do that as a team and to give each other feedback and then kind of monitor that process over time, but not do it, you know, we, we do it in a supportive kind of way, you know, um, and um, I, I always share this story um, that it is important to kind of get folks on the same page. Um, I, 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 early on, I was once training um, uh, 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 an interdisciplinary team of people to do these in uh, these these uh, key informant interviews, and one was a clinical psychologist, the other one was an MD, and the other one was like an old school anthropologist, and we did a side by side comparison of all the transcripts, and you could literally see, uh, and this these these were with people who had these. Um, um, histories of DWI, and it was looking at their trajectory over time. And you could kind of see where the clinical um, psychologists went straight into motivational interviewing. So, and the MD became very focused in giving advice when they heard things that were, prob you know, were behaviors that could negatively impact health behavior. And then the old school anthropologist just, just was like, interview guy, what's that? and just ask whatever questions. So doing this collaborative review together helps to kind of clarify the difference, especially when you're dealing with an interdisciplinary team, but also like start shifting people to be able to ask questions in a similar way. That was probably overkill response. Fantastic response, thank you. Uh, other questions? I think the other one actually was partially responded to, and there will be another session where we focus on that. So let's move on. All right. Uh, just in terms of training and capacity building, it's really important to have a consistent meeting schedule, which is really hard for me because I'm not so into meetings, but yes, it's really important. Um, when we start a new project, we'll compile and um, disseminate a master reading list so people are familiar with what we're kind of wanting to study. Um, we do hold collective trainings at the beginning of a project or sometimes when we're entering a new phase. Um, and when we do these collective trainings, that provides opportunity for team building, co-learning, skill enhancement. Um, what's really critical, especially in implementation science, is developing a shared vocabulary and knowledge of study issues as mentioned, a common understanding of key methods and processes, and we'll often use, you know, traditional didactics with hand-on learning um, exercises. I already talked about piloting both the data collection tools and the data collectors. So when you do this really early, um, not only are you getting feedback on your data collectors when you're looking at some of those transcripts, but you know what you need to fix in your data collection tool. Um, it's really important that people are familiar with needed technology like the fancy recorder you're going to be using, and if you're doing any of this work virtually. Um, and they also need to be able to um, convey to others, if you're doing this work virtually, how to use the technology so that participants are comfortable. Next slide. This is just a sample agenda um, from a training that we held for our study with Native American elders. And this training was designed for both um, of the, the, the research team, but also elder consultants. And what we did is we recruited um, elders from um, the communities we were working in to do the interviews with us and to really advise us on cultural etiquette, to help us with um, interpretation when necessary, because we were, um, you know, we were, um, there, there are some sensitivities, linguistic sensitivities when you're working with some of the tribal communities in New Mexico. Um, but, and, and they were also there to do the um, interviews and data collection themselves. Um, so we provided everybody with a study overview. We talked about the different roles and responsibilities 
of our more seasoned interviewers and our elder consultants. Um, we talked about undertaking research with culturally diverse Native American elders. Um, we, we gave up a, a, you know, a crash course in insurance systems and healthcare delivery. Um, and this was over a four day period. Um, we, we, we covered conducting qualitative interviews with um, practice and role play, conducting quantitative surveys, because that was also part of our data collection, human subjects issues, um, using problem-based learning activities, um, data collection and management procedures, and then the nuts and bolts about administrative stuff, like getting your per diem. Um, so that's just a sample training agenda. Um, I'm also gonna say it's really important to create protocols at the get-go. Um, so the administrative protocol, so I mentioned you know, per diem, so travel and per diem processing, um, participant reimbursement and incentives, um, team meeting schedules. Um, and uh, uh, the data management is especially important these days. Um, so having processes in place for, you know, safe and secure transcription, storage, tracking, monitoring, um, uh, maintaining the safety and security of your data. And also um, for several of our projects, we, we have protocols in case like a, a field worker encounters a mental health emergency. Um, we have had instances of unwanted sexual advances and harassment, and this would be working in clinical settings with like the director <laughs> um, engaging in um, untoward behavior. Um, what to do if you're in an unsafe situation and um, in the event of liability concerns. So we kind of have protocols for, that touch on all these different topics. Next slide. Um, you know, one other thing I want to mention, it's really good to if, because there's so much writing in qualitative work and the need in implementation science to also be able to turn over the data very, very quickly. So you do need people who are also committed to writing, to filling out their template after they did an interview, um, to um, creating memos when they're analyze, they're coding and analyzing data. So I, I just wanted to emphasize having, um, you know, people who want to write, even if they're not the best writer, but they're willing to put their thoughts on, on paper. Um, I think that's an asset to your team. Um, any other ideas for organizing or supporting qualitative research teams that we didn't consider? All right, I'm going to move to uh, Daniel. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> um, so the last uh, part of our session today, we'll be talking about developing qualitative assessments. Um, and we'll start off with a little bit of general guidance and then move into talking about interviews and focus groups. And then if time permits, we'll touch on observation guides. Um, so some general guidance around um, your, uh, your qualitative um, uh, data collection uh, assessments. Um, you'll want to think about what data you need in order to answer your questions, right? So going back to your proposal, thinking about your conceptual model or your theoretical framework, um, figuring out what types of data you need and what types of methods will elicit that data to answer your questions. Um, and this is really great to discuss in, um, in, within your team collectively. Um, this is probably most likely if you're carrying out a study already been decided. <laughs> um, but if you're figuring this out, um, team brainstorming really helps with uh, figuring out what methods you want. Um, some things to consider are the pluses and minuses, the positive and negatives of each of these different uh, methods. So, for example, thinking about formal semi structured interviews. What you're going to get is what people think or say about something, but what you might miss is what they actually do right. Participant observation is really great at getting at what people actually do. You're going to get lots of rich descriptive data based on experience, but it probably is not going to be uniform across researchers and across your research sites because it's very dependent on the individual and the circumstances. 
Um, you also also want to think about the pragmatic factors um, around your data method, your data collection methods. Um, so think about the settings, like Katie mentioned earlier. The setting is really important to what kinds of data you're going to get. Um, is it going to be in a public space, in a clinic, in a social service agency, um, a prison? Um, all of those spaces require different considerations for what kinds of data collection methods you're going to be using. Um, sample sizes and access to participants is another key piece. Um, sample sizes for qualitative research, um, you're probably not going to want to carry out 120 interviews within a week. It's probably not possible. Um, you want to make sure that you have access to the people that you want to talk to and want to observe. Um, if you do not have access to folks that are uh, incarcerated, probably you don't want to try to do interviews with them. Um, thinking through the anticipated burden on participants, um, if folks are super busy, like we mentioned earlier in school-based health centers, we're opting for repeats and um, informal interviews in place of really formal, structured, scheduled interviews with folks um, because we want to make sure that they um, uh, don't feel like the data collection is a major burden on them because we're already asking them to implement and their surveys and a focus group at the end of the process. Um, time, how much time do you have to collect data? Um, how much time do you have for individual data collection events? Um, all of that will determine what types of methods you're, you're thinking about. Cost, do you have to travel? How much does transcription cost? <laughs> how much are you going to provide people and incentives for participating in your data collection methods? Higher burden methods might require higher incentives. Um, and then if you're proposing research methods that are really costly in people power and resources um, for both collection and analysis, um, you might want to you want to consider that for um, which methods you're you're selecting. <clears throat> So um, two kind of big <laughs> overarching guidance points for qualitative data collection is to ask, observe, and then ask and observe again. For lack of a better term, in my mind, I like to think of this as like fractal triangulation. Um, in <laughs> mixed method research, you're trying to triangulate between different methods. Within a method, you're trying to triangulate across different types of participants. And then within an interview or an observation, you're also trying to get at the same ideas in multiple different kinds of angles without necessarily being super redundant so that you're able to get really rich information and rich data around those, those domains. Um, so in interviews, this might, might um, include things like rewording your question, asking it again, asking probes, or even asking semi-overlapping questions um, <laughs> to try and get at that, that data. Um, for observations, it might require repeated observations, observing different people at different time points, the same person at different time points. And then the second really big bullet is to make sure that the team is all on the same page. Try to eliminate any confusion over why you're asking or why you're observing something. You wanna make it really clear within your team um, and within the assessment, the guidance that's included in the assessment, why each of those particular kind of sections of questions or prompts for observation are included. Um, and then that helps drive the team for when you need to have the flexibility of moving from a structured interview to a semi-structured or semi-structured to unstructured. You still have those main points that you wanna hit um, when you go into each of these interactions. So if you do need to pivot a little bit and be flexible, you're still able to get the data that answers your, your project's um, objectives. <laughs> Thanks, Borsica, you're already looking up fractal triangulation. <laughs> um, another fun band name, I think, right? Um, <laughs> So moving from general guidance to some guidance around designing interviews and focus group guides. And this is just going to kind of scrape the, the first layer of these things. Um, we'll have another session really digging in deep into interviews and focus groups. Um, but so you want to make sure that your guides for these are structured to meet study objectives, yet loose enough um, to be able to follow up on leads when interesting or emergent topics come up. Um, so the flexibility of being able to listen to someone's um, story rather than 
marching them through a whole bunch of questions. Um, and think about the fact that even if you're using the same guide, no two interviews or data collection sessions are going to be exactly the same. Setting is probably going to change. The participants are changing. Um, the way that you feel that day is going to change. The way your participant feels that day is going to change. Um, everything down to whether or not somebody's eaten before you're talking to them will impact um, the data collection. <laughs> and everybody's nodding. The data collection event. Um, and the guide should be really geared towards trying to get stories. The, the value, one of the values of qualitative research really is this like drive to collect narrative stories, um, to collect experiences, to collect concrete examples of how the things that we're interested in manifest in people's lives. For designing interview and focus group guides, um, you want to rem remind yourself over and over again that the guide is not a questionnaire. Um, you're asking questions of your participants. Um, you're not really trying to, to quantify results. Um, and questionnaires are not about conversation and storytelling. They're, they're not going to be eliciting the types of information that you really want out of interviews and focus groups. Um, most guides are going to follow this kind of funnel structure, moving from really general topics to more specific topics. Um, and you'll want to break it down in that direction because it allows for folks to feel a little bit more relaxed and open and build trust with you at the outside of the interview. And then once you have that kind of rapport built, you're able to shift into the more sensitive topics further into the interview. You don't necessarily want to jump straight into these really sensitive um, personal kinds of questions from the outset because that's going to shut folks down and then they're going to be less likely to answer the rest of your questions. Um, just a little bit more on kind of the, the guide. So like I said, starting off broad, allowing yourself maybe some warm up questions. Um, the softball questions, the very easy questions for folks to answer. So they already, it kind of takes their guard down around being asked questions. Interviews are very uncomfortable situations for most folks. And so if you can build in a couple of kind of warm up questions at the beginning, that's going to go a long way for improving the types of data you're able to, to collect from folks. Particularly if you're asking really sensitive questions, allowing for a cool off period and a closure at the end is a great idea. Um, trying to bring folks back to those kinds of easy questions. Um, I really like when we ask really, um, really difficult questions that elicit uh, stories about negative experiences or negative emotions um, to turn, turn the questions around and ask about a positive experience or a positive emotion at the end. So that's the type of feeling and type of topic that you're leaving folks with rather than leaving them hanging on something really horrible that's happened to them in the past. Um, when you're sequencing questions, thinking about time, um, you want to ask about earlier events in folks' lives first and then move towards more recent. Um, think about the time that you're dedicating to different topics or domains based on um, your conceptual approach um, for the interview. Um, complexity will follow that same type of funnel action where you're asking simpler questions at the beginning, moving to more complex, asking about more concrete things at the beginning, moving to more abstract, um, starting with least threatening, moving to more serious and more sensitive questions. Um, and then, of course, always end on a positive note. Always say thank you. <laughs> uh, politeness goes a long way in making sure that your participants want to talk to you again. Um, so then thinking specifically about the types of questions, um, the questions that you want to ask during an interview, you want to make sure that they're singular and neutral. So you're really only wanting to ask about one thing at a time, and you don't want to frame it in a way that implies that there's a right or a wrong response. This goes with your wording and the way that you ask the question. Um, you want to make sure that clear that questions are clear and easily understandable. Um, so just like if you were um, conducting interviews with folks that primarily spoke Spanish, English, German, you're going to interview them in that language, Spanish, English, German. Um, just like that, you would use um, terminology, vocabulary, phrases, things that resonate with the folks that you're interviewing. Um, most folks don't 
use terms like implementation strategy or embedding mechanism. Um, so making sure that you're using words that convey the meaning but are um, understandable for folks that you're talking to. Um, and then you want to make sure your questions are open ended, um, that you're listing experiences, opinions, knowledge, um, and not treating it like some sort of quiz or an interrogation to your, your participant. You want to leave space for them to be able to speak and elaborate and tell stories. On the flip side of that, what kinds of questions not to ask, <laughs> which we see a lot, um, you want to avoid those dichotomous questions, um, questions that allow a participant to get away with a yes or no answer. Um, that is going to cut off conversation. So you want to frame questions in a way that does not allow for a yes or a no. You want to avoid double barreled questions. So making sure you're only asking about one thing at one point in time. Um, questions that are too long will lose participants' attention and they will ask you to repeat the question again. If that happens, it's not a good question. You want to make sure that they're short enough <laughs> that folks don't need you to need to ask you to repeat yourself. Um, Similar to what I've already said, avoid jargon laden questions. Um, so avoid uh, terminology that's really specific to our fields. Um, and then avoid leading questions. So like, what, like on the first slide, I said avoid questions that say yes or no, or, in, or, or imply that there's a right or wrong answer. Here you wanna try and ask, you wanna avoid asking questions that elicit a particular kind of response from folks. Um, so the one that I was thinking about earlier today is like, why is your boss supportive of you? <laughs> or why do you think your boss is supportive? Um, it implies that they should be answering that their boss is supportive of them. Um, having a good guide really is beneficial for this work. Um, it helps minimize variation across researchers. Like uh, Katie was mentioning earlier, when we come from different disciplinary backgrounds, we tend to conduct interviews very differently. And so a guide helps kind of minimize that um, variety. Um, it helps you with your efficiency in time management. Um, if you know what you need to ask in the order and you have probes, it helps you just hone in on the types of topics that you need to elicit data about. Um, it makes it much easier to compare responses. Um, when you have a, a semi-structured or more structured interview and you're asking the same questions of folks, you can take that data and compare across questions. Um, when you have really unstructured or informal interviews, it makes it a bit more difficult because you have to search through the transcripts to find the answers to that data. It's still there, but it does make it a bit more um, complicated for analysis um, and to pull things for specific uh, subject areas. Um, and it also helps enhance uh, credibility of this work. That's one of the big um, kinds of critiques of qualitative work that we get a lot, right? Is that um, we need to work on credibility and having really solid interview guides that folks are trained on and using consistently helps enhance that. Um, and I think we'll answer the question in the chat in just a minute, if that's okay. <laughs> um, in the last couple of minutes here, I do want to touch on observation guides because I feel like observation tends to get the short end of the stick and I think it is extremely valuable. Um, so when you're constructing observation guides, this is not necessarily for participant observation, but if you're sending researchers into different areas or different settings to do observations, you might want to consider having an observation guide. Um, so just like for an interview guide, think about your research questions, think about your conceptual model, and think about the types of things you need to actually observe. Um, so what can you not get from other types, of inter uh, other types of data collection methods that are less burdensome, interviews, focus groups? Um, what can you only get from direct observation? And then you want to create a guide that prompts teams to specific objects of study, so events, meetings, um, intake procedures, those types of stuff. Um, and the types of details that are important for them to, to collect or pay attention to in their observations. And this can include questions for the researcher and the participants, as well as prompts for action. So a question for the researcher might be, keep in mind, in what ways is um, LGBTQ identity represented within the space of the clinic? A prompt for the researcher to ask participants might be, how comfortable are you in asking questions about sexual orientation? And then maybe there's a prompt for the researcher to do something like draw a map of the physical space. 
Um, for the structure, you want to, the level of structure for an observation guide is really going to depend on the level of detail that you need. And to contrast here, just to show an example, um, maybe in some instances, you really only need the characteristics of individuals and the interactions taking place. Maybe in other instances, based on your research questions, you need to actually time certain segments of the interaction. How long does it take a patient to complete an intake form? Um, you want to include prompts to consider points of comparison um, that are observable within the setting, so categories of participants maybe, and then leave space for general impressions or other observations. I know we're at the end of our time, um, but I want just to briefly touch on um, the use of this particular um, observation method. Um, rapid assessment procedure informed clinical ethnography. It's a form of observation uh, of uh, ethnography that can be used in clinics where you're really limited on time. Um, you use a team, multidisciplinary team, including clinicians, where you're collecting data, checking in with your team about what you saw, go back, collect more data, check in with your team about what you saw. Um, and you can conduct this very, very quickly because of that collection, analysis, interpretation, more collection, that iterative process. Um, and we created one for uh, a guide for this for use in school-based health centers. Um, it has a two-part structure, a protocol and activity guide, and then an observation template. The protocol includes steps to follow and then subjected, suggested activities for observation. So planning when you're gonna go, <laughs> uh, discussing with the point of contact, things like getting a tour, asking front desk to do mock intake with you. And then it also includes topics for discussion for those informal interviews. So ours is informed by the exploration, preparation, implementation, sustainment framework. Um, and we have prompts for each of those kind of chunks of factors. And so you can see what it looks like. Um, I just included the first little bit of the observation template. We have a basic activity log of what's going on and then a space to talk about the relationships and interactions of staff and patients and a map of the space that um, gets directly at one of the recommendation areas that we're trying to implement. <laughs> so um, I think we're up for our time. <laughs> um, but so just to give a nod to the upcoming sessions, um, there's some coming up on ethnographic research and periodic reflections, conducting interviews and focus groups, analyzing data um, and community engagement. Um, and we're happy to follow up with anyone if you have extra questions. Um, I know that the consultation period is starting